Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Queen Pasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to tell you once again about Chilling. The Chilling app is available on Android, on iPhone, and just about any kind of phone that you can be able to run apps on, which I would imagine anything above a flip phone these days. The Chilling app allows you to listen to Creepypasta stories in a lot of ways that you're doing right now, except it doesn't just have me, even though I am on there. I'll tell you right now, I did some pretty good ones this month that should be coming out. But there are also a bunch of other narrators on there, including my friend, like Autumn Ivy. And it has this really cool feature that allows you to do stuff like pick your own background music or background sounds. So it has a lot more versatility than YouTube and you can start your free trial right now. If you go over download chilling, you'll be able to start your free trial. And if you leave a review and go over to thechillingapp.com, literally that's the text, thechillingapp.com slash Xbox X, you can actually win a Series X, which is uh, pretty cool because I think they've done PS5 bundles up till now. So, hey, we're, we're going back around and we're trying for the, uh, the other crowd now, the Xbox crowd. You can win yourself an Xbox Series X, which includes the console, a second Xbox wireless controller, and the best Resident Evil game, Resident Evil Village, and Elden Ring, which I have lost literal weeks to in real time. Not joking. I've been addicted to this game. So get yourself a copy right now for free. All you got to do is head over to the chillingapp.com slash Xbox X. Check out Chilling App. It's a lot of fun. And now on to tonight's story. Johnny Masterson sat up in his bed, his large calloused hands hanging between his knees. A single silent tear ran down his scarred, rugged face. From across the room, there came a hard knock upon his door. Fuck off, he yelled angry and tired in his grief. Yet the ponderous knocking continued. Son of a bitch, Johnny growled, leaping from his bed and tearing open the door. I told you to fuck. But there he stopped as he looked into the glowing blue eyes of the archangel Raphael. Hello, Johnny. The angel spoke softly. You seem a little angry. You can take a swing at me if you think it would make you feel any better. What would be the point? Johnny sighed, stepping aside to let the glowing angel pass, then collapsing onto the bed. One may as well try to pummel the ocean. What do you want, Raphael? I want nothing, the angel responded, sitting gracefully upon a nearby chair. I came to give you my deepest sympathies. I know that Father Matthew was a dear friend of yours. It was much more than that, Johnny sighed. He raised me, trained me to survive, looked after me when I was sick, scared as a child. He was my father in all but blood. Yes, Raphael responded. This I understand. He was a great man and will be missed by us all. He was a powerful warrior in his time and a true servant of God. Yeah, Johnny replied, his voice breaking a little. I'll miss him. He should never have been sent to this place. We thought it safe, Raphael said, his wings stirring uneasily. We wish to reclaim the island for the church and the glory of God. We sent many priests and guards, but only Father Matthew made it back. With his dying breath, he warned us of the danger there. Tavalara, a shit spat island. A rock outcrop with a single beach. That's what he died for. Johnny, the angel shook his head sadly. We have to take back this world one piece at a time. Tavalara was to be our staging point for the invasion of Sardinia. You say the island is nothing more than a piece of rock. But the beach is long and wide. Before the fall, there were cafes, restaurants there that catered to the many visitors to the island. The surrounding sea is rich with sea life. Father Matthew knew all this. He understood how much we needed a victory, even a small one. We can't take back the world, hiding in this place forever. I have to go to Tavalara. Johnny said, glaring at the angel. But you knew that already, didn't you? You knew I wouldn't let it rest. And that I... I would have to have vengeance for Matthew's death. Yes. The angel replied, his face a mask of neutrality. 
Johnny said nothing, but reached across the bed, grabbing up his nearby sword. He didn't unsheathe it, but placed it between his legs, both hands gripping the hilt. You once told me that there was nothing under heaven or hell that this sword couldn't kill. I did, the angel replied, his eyes narrowing. Will you answer me a question, Raphael? Johnny said, still not looking up from his sword. If it is within my power to do so, I will answer your question. That's good, Johnny replied. There should always be a truth between allies. So tell me, Raphael, did you send Father Matthew and the others there to die so I would try to take back the island for you? Did, did you make a sacrifice of them? The angel looked at Johnny, sensing the man's uncertainty and rage. No, I did not. Swear it, Johnny growled, sweat pouring down his brow, his sword held in a two-handed death grip, knuckles bleached white. Swear it on the name of your god. He is your god too, Johnny. Suddenly Johnny was on his feet, tearing the glowing sword from the sheath. Don't play fucking word games with me, Raphael. Swear it now, before god or one of us dies here, right now, today. Even before Johnny's towering rage... The angel did not move, but only sat there, its face impassive. All right, Johnny. Even though it is a sin to swear on the name of God, I do so swear it before God and all the heavenly hosts. I did not send Father Matthew and the others to the island to die. Johnny let out a long breath and sat down hard, his hands shaking. Okay, I believe you. How very good of you, the angel retorted, and for the first time in a long time, Johnny heard some emotion in the creature's voice. Tell me, Johnny, what would you have done if I had said yes? But you didn't, Johnny replied, and for now, that's enough. Let me make something clear to you, the angel said, standing. I don't like being threatened. I can only believe that your sadness and grief has brought on a sort of temporary insanity. You are of great use to me, Johnny. Let's hope for your sake. It stays that way. That said, he stalked out of the room, slamming the door hard behind him. Yeah. Johnny said, laying back down and closing his eyes. We all have our uses. Two days later found Johnny walking along the road of sorrow. It was winter now and the air held a bitter chill. Raphael had offered to send a whole regiment of the Swiss Guard with him on his most dangerous mission, but Johnny had declined. He worked best alone. Besides, he didn't want to have to worry about covering anybody's ass but his own. Settling his pack more comfortably, he strolled on towards Ostica Antica, not really seeing the lush countryside all around him. He was too busy thinking of Father Matthew and his dying words. Johnny had been in the Basilica, praying when a young priest had suddenly burst in. Mr. Masterson? Mr. Masterson! He squawked, hurrying towards Johnny who shot to his feet. You must come quickly. It's Father Matthew! Has he returned? Johnny asked not liking the sound or the dread in the other man's voice. He's hurt so badly, the priest blustered. Where is he? Johnny grabbed him up by the collar. Stop your rambling, speak sense. In the square, lying in the filth. Son of a bitch, Johnny growled and shoved the man away and headed for the door. He emerged in the bright sunlight, trying his best to avoid milling refugees, leaning hovels and rusting caravans. Everywhere he passed, there were cries for help, for food and the unwashed masses that now called Vatican City their home. Father Matthew! Father Matthew! Johnny yelled over the ruckus. This way! A voice called from Johnny's right. Father Matthew's this way! Johnny turned to see one of the Swiss guard who were turning roughly, pushing his way through the growing crowd with Johnny hot on his heels. Johnny found his old friend and mentor between two marble pillars lying in the filth. 
and one of the few Vatican doctors pushed bloody wads of bandages against his chest. Johnny! Matthew called out, blood staining his lips. I'm here, old friend, Johnny said, falling to his knees and taking the old man's quivering hand. Johnny! Matthew smiled. It's good to see you, boy. Matthew! Matthew, what happened to you? There are people there on the island. People and something else. They worship it, Johnny. They actually worship that thing. What thing? Johnny asked desperately, but the old man... The old man was starting to fade now, his breath becoming uneven and shallow. With the last of his failing strength, he took Johnny's face in his hands. I love you, boy. You've been like a son to me. I'm proud of the man that you've become. And you're like a father to me, Johnny said. But his words fell on deaf ears as the light from Father Matthew's eyes faded and his hand fell away, leaving a bloody trail down Johnny's face. Fuck! Johnny yelled, leaping to his feet. Some of the crowd that had started to gather took one look at Johnny's face and quickly dispersed. Even some of the Swiss guards shifted nervously at the look of rage stamped across his scarred and battered features. Johnny was a big man. If he decided to go on a rage-induced rampage, it would take a hell of a lot to bring him down. For a moment, he just stood there, shoulders hunched, taking in huge, deep breaths before stomping angrily away, the remaining crowd parting before him like the Red Sea from Moses. Now, as he arrived at the gates of Ostica Antica, that rage was more or less under control, but still simmered just below the surface. Who goes there? A man called from the battlements. Johnny Masterson, open the gate. There was a brief exchange before two men, and moments later, the sturdy wooded gate creaked open by a smiling guard. Johnny Masterson, the man said, grinning from ear to ear. I've heard all about you. Now you save the city, slew some kind of big shot demon? Yeah, Johnny said, pushing past. That's me. Where can I find his eminence, James Malloy? He's in his quarters, the other man said, taking the lead. This way, follow me. Johnny was pleased to see the city was getting back on his feet after the devastation that had been caused here. Johnny had put a stop to that and restored order, but he couldn't save the people who had once lived and worked here, supplying the Vatican refugees with much-needed fish from the port city. All he could do was avenge them, and he had done so, taking the demon's head with one swing of his glowing blade, snuffing out its evil and the terrible spell it had cast over the whole city, turning brother against brother until there were nothing left. But now the city was rebuilding, even thriving under the ever-watchful eye of Cardinal Malloy. We're here, the guard said, stopping before a large squat building that glowed from the inside and smelled of fresh paint. His eminence is inside. Should I announce you? No, Johnny replied, heading inside. His eminence and I are old friends. The inside of the building was plain but comfortable, with a large glowing fireplace, threadbare rugs upon the floor, and a small table with chairs where Cardinal Malloy sat engrossed in a large, leather-bound book. His mouth mumbling as he read by candlelight in the glowing gloom. At Johnny's approach, he looked up, a large grin showing not too many remaining teeth flashed across his wrinkled features. Johnny Masterson, is that you? By God... You seem to grow an inch taller every time I see you. Come in. Come and take a seat. Johnny did as he was bid, grinning broadly. And you seem to be getting older with every passing day. <laughs> How old are you now, your eminence? Must be 112, the old man chuckled. I must have been at least that age when we met, when you were no more than a boy. I have a deal with God, Johnny. He winked slightly. As long as I'm of use to him, he'll keep me alive. That we would all have such a deal, Johnny said sadly. Ah, the old man said, patting his hand gently. You speak of Father Matthew. He was a good friend to me, even better one to you, I think. But console yourself with this, Johnny. If any man has earned their ticket to heaven, Father Matthew was the one. 
May he sit at the right hand of God forever, Johnny said, making the sign of the cross. He'll be watching you, Johnny. What was it he always said to you? Johnny smiled then. Uh, he used to tell me that God looks after his own, but keep your weapons loaded and your steel sharp. That's it. <laughs> That's it. The old man chuckled. And he was right on both accounts. But tell me, Johnny, why are you here? I need a boat. And a captain to sail it. I'm headed to Tavalara to sum up the situation. And to get revenge. The cardinal asked with one bushy arched eyebrow. <sighs> Aye, and to get revenge. He told me with his dying breath there was something on the island, an evil that people worship. I intend to go there and put an end to this abomination, whatever it may be. And the people? The cardinal asked. Johnny shrugged. If they get in my way, I'll cut them down. Those who worship such things deserve no mercy. It is for God to judge, not us, my son. Haven't you heard? Johnny smiled thinly. Seems these days he's contracted the job out to me, and I intend to carry it out. Judge, jury, and executioner. The cardinal said nothing. Lost in his own thoughts as he watched the dancing firelight reflect in Johnny's eyes. Outside, the moon rose pale and bloated, holding dominion over the cold night sky. Johnny awoke early the next day, a strange priest looming above him. Stop breathing all over me, priest, Johnny said, sitting up and rubbing the sleep from his eyes. The priest took a couple of polite steps backwards and waited as Johnny strapped on various bits of equipment, finishing by sheathing the sword at his back. Is the boat ready? Hey, yes, all's been taken care of, the priest replied, looking at the ground, his greasy hair obscuring his face. Johnny's eyes narrowed at the sound of the other man's voice. I know you, priest, don't I? Yeah, we've met before, Mr. Masterson, he said, squirming uncomfortably. You threatened to geld me once? <laughs> I remember you now, Johnny snarled. Father Michael, right. We met in St. Peter's Square. You tried to have that old beggar executed for laying hands on your precious person. I was an arrogant fool back then. He shook his head sadly puffed up with pride in my own perceived self-importance, but this place has taught me humility, Mr. Masterson. It's taught me humility very well. Is that so? Johnny said, wondering what could bring such a change in a man like this. Oh, yes, Father Michael continued as they stepped outside, the warm morning sun driving back last night's chill. I arrived here as a part of the cleanup crew, under the command of Cardinal Malloy, you had killed the demon, but it had left so much chaos in its wake. Even in the warm morning sunshine, the priest shuddered, his eyes far away as if reliving the horror of those days. It was horrific. I can think of no other words to describe it. The people had murdered each other, torn one another to pieces. There was blood. Blood everywhere in the children. He groped for the words. The children were the worst. Their own parents had turned on them. Tears were openly streaming down his face now. In one house, there was a cooking pot and tiny bones. They had been broken open and gnawed upon, and we had to clean it up. We had to fix it. Stop it now, Father, Johnny said, placing a comforting hand on the other man's shoulder. The past is done. We must look on to the future. That's all we have left. Yes, of course, the priest said, wiping his eyes, embarrassed now. Please follow me, Mr. Masterson. A boat has been procured, and our finest captain put at your disposal. Johnny nodded his thanks. They continued down the narrow streets of Ostia Antica. The sharp tang of the ocean carried on the breeze. Finally, they reached the docks. It was here that Father Michael turned to face Johnny... Once again, a look of growing concern on his face. 
I must tell you something before you get on board, he said, wiping the sweat from his brow. It's on your mind, Johnny said, eager to be on his way. The priest coughed nervously. The captain of the ship, he said, throwing a thumb over his shoulder at the bobbing vessel. Well, Mr. Masterson, there's no easy way to say this. The captain is one of Gabriel's chosen. In other words, he is a dead man. Johnny said his goodbyes, hoping the wretched priest would find some peace in the coming days before crossing the gangplank. Permission to come aboard, he hollered. You're already on board, a hoarse voice replied from the boat's darkened cabin. Johnny took a deep breath, not knowing what to expect, as a dark figure detached itself from the shadows and emerged more fully into the light. The captain was tall and skeletal thin, his flesh gray and sunken down tightly off of his bones. His eyes rolled wetly in their hollow sockets, and his lips were black and shriveled as he smiled at Johnny with his tombstone grin. "'Seen enough!' he croaked, his smile growing tight around the edges. "'Sorry!' Johnny replied, realizing he had been staring. It's just I've... I've not seen one of your kind in such a long time. I thought all of Gabriel's chosen had long been destroyed, or offered themselves up to the other side. Gabriel's chosen, Captain whispered. I haven't been called by that name for such a long time. Usually it's zombie, or rotter. <laughs> Although the people here are much kinder than most... And you know the way to the island? Johnny asked, shrugging out his pack. Know the way? The captain huffed. Boy, I've been sailing these waters for nearly 80 years before I went down into the cold iron earth. When Gabriel blew his trumpet, I rose from my own grave, and I've sailed these waters ever since. Eh, forgive me, Johnny smiled. It's no offense intended. And tell me, how long will it take to reach the island? A half a day depending on the wind. I'll use the sail, fuel being so scarce and all. Okay. Do you need me to do anything? Sit back. Relax, Captain said, heading for the wheelhouse. We'll have you there in no time at all. Johnny sat on the deck for a couple of hours before sheer boredom and his own restless nature caused him to seek out the captain. You're not gonna ask me if we're there yet, are you? The captain smiled, revealing blackened gums as Johnny entered the wheelhouse. It just, it just suddenly occurred to me while I was sitting on my ass in the sunshine that I never asked her name. Johnny asked. Ahab. The captain winked at him. Captain Ahab. Johnny burst into laughter. Please tell me you aren't out here trying to catch whales. The captain's smile grew broader. You don't have time right now. Maybe on the way back. Johnny grew somber. You may be taking the journey back alone. Tell me what you know of the people in the island. The captain frowned. The only people I ever saw there were visiting tourists. Oh, and the Rossi family. They had a small villa there. Husband was some sort of hotshot broker. Brought up a large part of the island, but lost it to his wife in the divorce settlement. Apart from that... No other people that I know of. Well, they are there somewhere on the island. I killed my friend. Yeah, the captain replied, checking his instruments. Yeah, I've heard of this. He even saw some of those men aboard one of those fishing boats. I was told only one returned, but we were never told why. That was my mentor, Father Matthew. With his dying breath, he told me the evil that lurks in this place. Evil, the captain said, turning to face Johnny. Yes, evil. He told us the people were worshipping it. And if that's so, Johnny smiled. And their lives are forfeit. And the captain shuddered at that smile, proving even a dead man would feel afraid. A few hours later, they made landfall, mooring the boat in the shallows of a small cove. You're sure about this, Johnny said, strapping on his sword and gathering up his equipment. Of course I am, the captain huffed, pointing at a winding path that led up the cliffside. Just give me a second. But Johnny had already leapt to the churning waters. The captain returned moments later, leaping into the sea by Johnny's side. 
the world's oldest shotgun cradled across his shoulder. The hell you think you're going? Johnny frowned, ignoring the lapping water at his thighs. I'm coming with you, the captain called over his shoulder as he headed for the shore. The hell you are, Johnny splashed after him. You're going to get your full self killed. The captain laughed at this. How do you kill a dead man? At this point, death would be a release. Besides, you said evil resides here and I tend to help you destroy it. Isn't that why my master Gabriel raised me back from the dead? Myself and all my brothers. And where are they now? Gone back down into the dust. And so, I will come with you and perhaps earn myself a place in heaven once again. Okay, Johnny said, placing a warm hand on the other man's shoulder. Together then. Lead the way. Ten minutes later, after much cursing and sweating, they reached the cliff top. The rest of the island opening up before them. Over there, the captain called, pointing off into the distance. Johnny followed his gaze, noting a large villa-like structure off in the distance. As good a place as any to get started, he said, taking the lead. The captain close behind him, eyes watchful for any kind of movement, but there was nothing. Only the sighing of the wind through the tall grass. They had reached the boundary gate now that bordered the property. The villa, like the gate, was in ill repair, all peeling paint, smashed windows, and sagging roof, giving it an almost hunched kind of appearance. I don't like it, the captain said as they pushed through the gate. Johnny said nothing, but he must have felt something, for his sidearm was already in his hand, locked and loaded and ready to go. There's something here, Johnny, the captain said, a slight tremble in his voice. Can you feel it? Johnny was just about to answer when there came a sudden clatter from underfoot. Mother of God, he said, making the sign of the cross. What is it? The captain said, scurrying up to Johnny's side. God help us, he stammered, looking in horror at the scattered bones that littered the doorway. Looks like some kind of fucked up shrine, Johnny said, noticing the burnt and melted candles amongst the smoldering bones. The captain kneeled down and picked up a small rib cage. Children, he shuddered. They're all children's bones. Even babies. And look at this, he said, holding up the bone for Johnny to see. They're teeth marks. These bones have been gnawed upon. Not too late to go back to the boat, Johnny said, drawing his sword. I'm with you, the captain smiled weakly. After all, what does a dead man really have to lose? Okay, Johnny said, taking a deep breath. Let's get this done. Johnny stepped over the smoldering piles of bones, glowing sword held out before him. The captain tied at his back, shotgun at the ready. As Johnny stepped over the threshold, his sword suddenly blazed into a searing light. Stop that! Johnny hissed. The sword in his hand jumped almost guiltily before dimming, someone allowing him to get his first look at the dimly lit interior. They were in a grimy kitchen now, the place in total disarray. Everywhere, there was rotten food and chunks of meat crawling with maggots. The walls were smeared in grease and covered in dried blood. In the filth-covered sink, a pile of bones gleamed stupidly amongst moldy dishes and fly-blown tatters of flesh. Mother of God, Johnny said, swallowing hard. What is this place? Hell, the captain replied from over his shoulder, or some creature's version of it anyway. Whatever it is, Johnny said, trying to get a grip on his whirling emotions. I'm going to find it. And I'm going to kill it. The captain said nothing to this, but stuck close to Johnny as they passed through a narrow doorway that led into what had once been a stately-looking dining room. Not that there was much left. The once grand table and richly upholstered chairs had all been smashed into much kindling used to construct crude crosses that hung upside down from the peeling walls in a crude mockery of Christ. Here there was more blood drawn into vulgar shapes of humans mating with goats, pigs, and other low-born animals. Charming, Johnny muttered. What's this? The captain whispered, heading towards a nearby wall. Johnny followed, reading the writing there. Then Jesus said to the demon, What is your name, unclean spirit? To which the demon replied, We are legion, for we are many. It's scripture, Johnny said his face tight. From the book of Mark, it's written in shit. Come away from there. Let's find this creature, 
make it pay for these blasphemies. Are you looking for me? A woman's voice drifted from a nearby archway. Johnny cursed and spat about, calling himself seven kinds of a fool for being so easily distracted, yet no attack came. Signaling to the captain, both men slowly approached the doorway, which led into a gloomy sitting room. Sat on a dusty torn sofa was a woman, her back towards them. She did not move at their approach, but giggled obscenely as Johnny raised his sword for the killing strike. Johnny was just about to lunge when her head spun about with a tearing of tendons and the cracking of bones. The great Johnny Masterson, she hissed, her torn and tattered features brimming with hate. The great demon slayer himself, come to my own little corner of hell. How do you know me, demon? Johnny spat, sword trembling with eagerness to strike. Who does not know of the great Johnny Masterson? She laughed. The scourge of demon kind. Do you know what awaits you in hell, Johnny? What delicious torments have been planned for you? An eternity of anguish and terror as we tear your weeping soul apart. Father Matthew is waiting for you. Even now, I can hear his screams. Fuck you! Johnny charged with a shattering roar, swinging his sword wildly, determined to destroy his tormentor, but the demon moved with lightning speed, bounding from the sofa and latching onto the ceiling like a loathsome fly. Shots rang out, filling the room with smoke and the acrid smell of sulfur as the captain fired at the skittering demon. A wild shot caught her in the side and she fell hard upon the captain, clawing at his face. Johnny whirled about, but the demon leapt away, tearing off one of the captain's clutching arms in a flood of black, sticky ooze and launching the tattered appendage at Johnny's face. But Johnny stepped to the side and thrust forward. In one fluid motion, piercing the creature's shoulder with his glowing blade, the demon let out a cry of anguish as its flesh began to burn, yet it was far from done. It leapt high into the air and onto a nearby wall, its mouth gaping impossibly wide as a flood of black flies flooded from its gaping maw. Suddenly, Johnny was enveloped by the buzzing horde. Deafened and almost completely blind, he swung his glowing sword, trying to fend off any incoming attack. Just then, his foot came down on the groaning captain, and his legs dangled as he went down with a cry, his sword clattering away. The demon wasted no time, and with a shriek of triumph, surged forward, landing hard on top of the falling Johnny. See you in hell, Johnny! She screamed, spittle flying as she reared back, fangs exploding from her blackened gums, ready to tear Johnny's throat apart, and just then, an arm wrapped itself around her throat, and a white-hot crucifix was thrust into her burning flesh. The demon screamed in agony and bucked wildly, but the captain clung to her with his one good arm. Holy Mary, mother of God, he shrieked over and over again. Kill it, Masterson, for the love of God, kill it. Johnny's flailing hand struck his sword and he grabbed it up, feeling the power thrum up his arm as once again the sword erupted in a blazing light, dispelling the rancid flies. Seeing the glowing blade, the demon reared back, giving Johnny the perfect opportunity. Fuck you, he screamed, thrusting the blade forward, piercing the creature's chest and the heart beneath flowing through its body and exploding out of the creature's back, nearly impaling the captain who just managed to roll away. The thing shrieked and writhed above Johnny, its skin starting to smoke and peel, blackened blood frothing from its mouth. Cursing, Johnny pushed the dying demon away, freeing his sword, and by the time he managed to climb to his feet, the demon was no more than a large pile of ash. Let's get out of here, Johnny said. I've had more than enough of this shithole. The captain said nothing to this, but followed behind Johnny, holding the ragged stump where his arm had once been. Outside, a bunch of ragged and armed men awaited them. To hell now, Johnny said wearily. Put down your weapons, a tall man said, stepping forward, an upside-down cross staining the front of his cloth sack robe. Where's our master? If you mean that hell bitch inside, I gutter her like a pig, Johnny said, spitting into the dust. You lie, the man shrieked. Lilith is all powerful. She she can't die. Tough titty, said the kitty. Johnny growled. She's just as dead as shit. Take them. Take these defilers. They'll be sacrificed onto her. I don't think so, Johnny said as the men surged forward. There was no time to reach for his weapons, so he waded in with his fist, shattering bone and splitting flesh. But in the end, there was too many of them. He went down under a hail of flailing fists and booted feet. 
Quickly, the ragged men bound them and dragged them back to their feet as the robed priest of Lilith marched past and into the house. Johnny winced at the horrified scream that came from within. The robed man stomped back outside, his eyes wild and his face flushed with anger. You've done nothing, he said, slapping Johnny hard across his bruised and battered face. She'll return to us. She'll claim another body and return. <laughs> I, I don't think so, Johnny laughed. That bitch is burning in hell even as we speak. Silence! The priest spat into Johnny's face. One more word and I'll, I'll cut out your lying tongue. Johnny abruptly shut his mouth. Take them to the quarry. We will await her return, and then she'll kill these defilers. You're going to suffer, he said, turning back to the now silent Johnny. You're going to suffer like no other man has ever suffered before. Take them. The trip across the island to the quarry was short but brutal. Johnny, exhausted from his fight with the demon Lilith and badly bruised and battered, stumbled often under the blazing sun only to be dragged onwards by the choking rope around his neck. The captain, off balance by his missing arm, fell often and endured the same brutal treatment, although if he felt any pain, he didn't show it, but merely stumbled onwards, looking more zombie-like than ever with his missing arm and clawed-up face. Just as the sun reached its zenith, the men arrived with their prisoners in tow. The quarry was nothing more than a narrow gash cut into the cliffside before petering out towards the sea. As Johnny was forced down a set of narrow steps, he took the time to take notice of the denizens of this accursed place. For the most part, they were much like the men who now surrounded Johnny and the captain, filthy and disheveled. They seemed to have made their homes in the carved-out caves left behind by the quarried stone. But what Johnny noticed the most was that a good part of the population appeared to be women, and most, if not all of them, seemed to be in some state of pregnancy. Johnny shuddered at the implications of this, remembering the piles of small bones outside the lair of Lilith. Finally, they stopped at the bottom of the stairs and were forced towards a narrow stone pillar of roughly hewed rock, located close to the roaring ocean. As they drew nearer, Johnny noticed the chains and bloodstains that covered the sandstone and began a struggle, but was easily brought down by a spear butt to the back of the head. Cursing, the man dragged him, half-conscious, to the pillar and quickly chained him up. Johnny went away for a little while then, but came back to a soupy kind of consciousness with the setting sun. <laughs> You're awake, the captain muttered, where he sat in chains by Johnny's side. I was afraid you might never wake up. Johnny ignored this, examining the rusted chains bound tight around his chest and stomach. He tried to wiggle back and forth, but sat in a seated position, his legs splayed out in front of him. He could gain no real traction, so he gave up, trying desperately to save whatever strength he still had left. A nearby guard, noting Johnny was awake, hurried away but soon returned with an old crone and a young girl, carrying a bucket of water which splashed and dripped onto the sand-covered floor. At the sight of this, Johnny's stomach began to burn, and his cracked and bleeding lips began to ache. He was thirsty. In all his life, he'd never been thirstier. Give them a drink, the old woman commanded of the girl, and the guard stepped away. Not him, you fool, she said, slapping at the girl's arm. Dead men need no water. This one here. She snatched up the ladle, spilling half of its contents, as she thrust it rudely at Johnny's lips. Johnny drank thirstily, but the ladle was snatched away before he got little more than a few sips. Now then, the old crone said running her arthritic hands over Johnny's body. Let's see if you live. The inspection was quick, and none too gentle. When she had finished, she called over to the guard. This one will live, she said, pointing towards Johnny. He has a couple of cracked ribs and a broken nose, but he'll live. The main worry now is dehydration. Give him a drink every couple of hours. That's not my job, the guard bristled. It is now. The old woman rounded on him. Unless you want to explain to Lilith when she returns how you cheated her out of her vengeance. The guard paled at this. Some say she's dead, he whispered. For that one killed her with a magic sword. Silence, fool. If the archpriest hears such talk, he'll skin you alive. 
Lilith will return to us. She's more eternal than the fires of hell, and when she does return, she will want this sinner alive. So do your job or end your life upon the Tower of Pain, she said. That said, she left, taking the young girl with her. The guard watched her leave before grudgingly giving Johnny another drink, and then stomped off back to his post. Did you hear that? The captain whispered in Johnny's ear. The Tower of Pain. Now what in the hell do you think that could be? I have no idea, but I have a feeling we might find out before all this is over. And that's how it was for the next couple of days. They received water and some scraps of food two times a day. Once in the morning, once with the sun setting. The captain never ate or drank, but gave his portion to Johnny, whose strength had slowly started to return as his body went through the long process of healing itself. On the third night, the Archpriest of Lilith stood before them, guards in tow. Three days, he spat and our goddess has not returned to us. I have prayed, oh, how I have prayed, prayed upon my knees, have bled. But last night I had a dream. A dream of prophecy. It's not my blood that must be spilled. It, it must be yours, he said, drawing a long leather whip from behind his back. The blood of her defiler will draw her back to us. Get him on his feet. He commanded his men, Chain him high! Johnny did not resist as the men rushed in. There simply was no point. There were just too many of them, and he knew whatever punishment he was about to endure, it would not result in his death. Seconds later, he was chained to a rusty hook high upon the bloody pillar, his tattered shirt ripped from his back. I see you've known pain, the archpriest said, looking closer at the mass of scars that was Johnny's back. You'll know it again. Your blood and screams of pain will draw Lilith back to us. Johnny gritted his teeth, knowing what was coming, but still. The first lash tore at his back, causing him to groan in pain. A second followed closely, and Johnny felt the blood begin to flow down his quivering flesh. A third blow whistled down, and Johnny slumped, hanging by his arms, and yet he still would not scream. Another blow came, more frantic than the last, and now Johnny could smell his own blood perfuming the night air. You will scream, the archbishop raved, punctuating his command with another blow. I swear by the blood of Lucifer, you will scream. Go fuck yourself, Johnny spat, using his hatred to climb back to his feet. Your whore mistress is dead. No, a voice echoed through the cavernous walls. I am not. Lilith, the archpriest gasped, dropping the bloody whip and falling to his knees. You have returned unto us. That can't be, Johnny whispered craning his neck as he watched the cloaked figure descend to the quarry floor. The milling people all fell to their knees, their hands in the dirt as the demon passed shrouded in a cloud of flies. Only her eyes were visible as she glared her hatred at Johnny. Defiler, she hissed. Puppet of the Lamb of God. Do you really think you could destroy that which is eternal? You're dead, Johnny whispered again. You cannot be alive. Yet here I stand. The demon hissed. And you will pay for the desecration of my flesh. Yeah, Johnny said, regaining some of his composure. Well, get to it, bitch. He hoped to goad the demon into a fury. At this point, all he could hope for was a quick death, but the demon only smiled. Oh no, my friend. I know what you're about. Your death will be long and arduous. I shall feed off your screams and become powerful again. Bring him! she said, kicking the archpriest hard in his side. And we shall take him to the Tower of Pain and bring that fucking sword of his too. We shall cast it into the depths of the ocean. Never shall it be used against the minions of hell again. The archpriest scrambled away, his eager guards rushing in, freeing Johnny from the pillar, securing his hands and upper body in rusting chains. Just as the archpriest returned, sword in hand. For you, divine one, the archpriest fawned, presenting the sword to Lilith. Immediately, the sword burst into a blinding flame, and the demon screeched, scurrying back. Cover it, you fool! Cover that abomination before I tear out your heart! Yes, of course, mistress, he said, quickly tearing the cloak from his back and hurriedly wrapping the sword, smothering its glowing flames. Fool! The demon hissed, lunging forward. She dealt the priest a glancing blow, setting him crashing to the floor. Please, my goddess, 
The priest whimpered. Forgive me. Get on your feet, she said, looming above the bleeding man. And if you value your life, never show me that thing again. Of course, divine mistress, I live to serve you. Then do as I command. Bring that defiler and the dead man, too. He may feel no pain, but he can still watch his friend suffer. Come, she said, heading into the night. They shall feel hell's wrath upon the Tower of Pain. The Tower of Pain had once been a small watchtower, erected a few hundred years ago. It was now a shadow of its former self, slumped and crumpling. It emerged out of the darkness, their glowing torches casting dancing shadows across its crumbling masonry. Sweet God, the captain whispered to Johnny. Are you seeing this? I see it, Johnny said, trying to keep the tremor from his voice as they approached. Since the fall, he had seen many abominations, but nothing like this. The entire tower was festooned with decaying bodies. But that was only the beginning. The bodies had been defiled in the most grotesque way. Limbs had been torn away and replaced with animal parts. One man's head had been torn away, and a bloody wolf's head, tongue lolling, sewn onto his ragged neck. Another body that had once been the body of a woman had been nailed to the wall, her decaying legs spread wide. A curved goat horn had been rudely shoved into her, and one of her breasts had been removed and sewn up with rough fur. Johnny silently prayed to God that these poor wretches had been dead before they suffered such atrocities. Stop, Lilith commanded at the sagging entrance. Leave us. The scurrying guards quickly scurried away as if glad to be away from such a terrible place. You, she said to the archpriest. Bring them. Move, the archpriest said, shoving them through the doorway into which Lilith had just disappeared. And hope the mistress is feeling merciful. I've seen her draw out a sinner's agonies for days. Perhaps if you beg her forgiveness... Claw to her like the worms you are and lick her feet. She may show you some mercies. I doubt it, Johnny said as he entered the darkened tower. I shall give my soul over to God. Your God is weak, Lilith said, rounding on him. You shall beg for his mercy in the coming days, and he will give you none. Pray to me, Masterson, and I may show you the mercy you so crave. <laughs> Go fuck yourself, Johnny laughed. I'd rather pray to shit stinking awful. How dare you speak to the mistress? The archpriest screamed, slapping Johnny hard across the face. Leave him! Lilith commanded, taking a rusty blade from a bloodstained altar and drawing closer. He is mine. Of course, my goddess. But that's as far as he went. The demon rounded on him, thrusting the rusty blade through his open mouth, shearing through his neck and snapping his spine with a cruel twist. The priest fell to the floor like a felled tree, tearing the bloody blade from the grinning demon's hand. What the fuck? Johnny said, startled. The demon waved a hand across her face, and the swarming flies departed, revealing a young woman beneath. Even in his exhausted, battered state, Johnny's breath caught at the sight of her beauty. She grinned at him, as if sensing some of his thoughts. It was only when she began to speak that Johnny recoiled in horror, for the voice issuing from her curvaceous bow-shaped mouth was dark, booming, and dripping with evil. I see you like my little plaything. I am Asmodeus, and this is Terra, the voice said, making the girl pull down her hood, revealing raven-like locks beneath. Quite the piece, isn't she? I had her stow away on your ship, the demon chuckled. Asmodeus, Johnny growled, lost himself and the crowned prince of hell. You know what I did to your brother? Yes, the demon chuckled, and I thank you for it. He was always such a bore. What do you want here, demon? Why did you save us, or have you simply come to do the killing yourself? <laughs> Not at all. The demon laughed. I've come in the name of Raphael to bring you home, Johnny. You're a liar like all of your kind, Johnny growled, straining at his bonds. Raphael would crush you like a bug if you ever breathed in his direction. You're wrong, Masterson. Raphael and I have come to an agreement of sorts. Go home, Johnny. Ask him for yourself. 
the demon said, cutting his bonds. Terra here will guide you back to your ship. Speak to Raphael, then come and see me. The outcome of this war, perhaps, perhaps all of mankind, depends on it. And just like that, he was gone, leaving the startled girl behind. For a moment she swayed, then stood, proud and upright. My name is Tara, she grinned wickedly. It's a pleasure to finally meet you, Mr. Masterson. My master has spoken of you often. She offered him one slender hand. Johnny took it reluctantly, all the while thinking about deals with the devil. So what now? The captain asked. Now we go home, Johnny said, grabbing up his sword. I'm going to have a long talk with a certain angel. I'm going to have a very long talk with him indeed. The captain nodded and said nothing. Praying to God, he wouldn't be present for that particular conversation. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. If you guys are watching on YouTube, then that means you can find the podcast on Spotify or anywhere else that you happen to listen to podcasts. And if you guys are listening on the podcast, hey, if you want to find some older episodes or a whole bunch of stories you've never seen before, you should check out youtube.com slash mrcreepypasta. And no matter where you are, I really appreciate you hitting that subscribe button and hitting that bell reminder, just so that you can always find a new story as soon as it becomes available. And I want to give a big thank you, as always, to all of my Patreon subscribers on Patreon. Pa patron? All my patrons on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs. You are the ones that allow me to do stuff, like getting specific stories just for the channel. All those wonderful things that come from Dale Drake, those are because of all of you. If you guys want to see more of that, then I would really, really, really love if you guys could help support on Patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta like some of these wonderful guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Chaos Arts, Cryolinian, Milk and Meal, Silty K. Sterlerson, Zachary Graphius, It's All About That Fucking Music, Gorang Trimegacy, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchak, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Dabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Chelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, Sky Mara Ravenswood, William King, Darth Milver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Butterhawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Sicardi, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. You guys, as well as everybody if you look down in the description, and everybody that can even just give one dollar to be able to help things out, I really appreciate it. If you guys would like to join this list of names that I horribly, horribly mispronounce, check out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and honestly, even you guys who just listen, you watch, you comment, you like, you subscribe, thank you all. I really appreciate it. And sweet dreams.